When it comes to filmmakers associated with teen films, John Hughes is probably the name that gets mentioned the most. However, his career encompassed more than just stories about adolescence. Someone who could crank out an entire screenplay in less than a week, Hughes had all sorts of ideas he wanted to bring to the screen and put his characters into many kinds of situations. He got his start in advertising, before eventually writing for National Lampoon magazine. National Lampoon CEO Matty Simmons then asked Hughes to write a Jaws parody movie for Universal, titled Jaws 3, People Zero. Even though Steven Spielberg put an end to that project, that assignment helped bring Hughes to Hollywood, and it did not take long for him to rise up the ranks. One of his first successes was with National Lampoon's Vacation, based on a short story he wrote. Directed by Harold Ramis, it dealt with the exploits of the Griswold family as they tried to get to a theme park, Disneyland in the original story, and Wally World in the movie. Vacation showcased Hughes' penchant for creating funny scenarios as the Griswolds deal with one bad thing after another happening to them. Over the next several years, John Hughes' status rose as he became a major producer and continued to write all kinds of screenplays, some of which made it to screens and several others which were unproduced. He made his directorial debut with Sixteen Candles, which is what established him as creator of teen movies, although Hughes joked that the reason he wrote about teenagers was so he would not have to deal with a big established star talking back to him. While I know a lot of people have affection for Sixteen Candles, I don't think that film has held up particularly well, and it's mostly the presence of Molly Ringwald that has helped it remain popular. The actual contents of its story are uncomfortable in ways I don't think Hughes intended, and aside from Ringwald, there are very few characters you can get behind in the movie. I feel somewhat the same way about Weird Science, which has its moments here and there, but a number of jokes also fall flat for me. In contrast, The Breakfast Club is one of the examples of John Hughes at his best. It's a simple story about a group of teenagers who have to go to detention on Saturday, and over the course of the day spent there, they get to know each other and the film peels away at their stereotypes. When we get the big emotional speeches and the revelations about why they're in detention, they feel earned because their personalities have been properly developed. Hughes understood everything about who these five teens were when he wrote the screenplay, and he did a beautiful job of directing the film and making good use of his actors. A common element of John Hughes' work was his understanding of how to use music to enhance his films. He had impressive knowledge about the songs he grew up with and the acts younger people were listening to, so he used a great assortment of pre-existing songs, as well as commissioning newer bands to produce new original songs, like Ongo Bongo for the Weird Science theme and Simple Minds for Don't You Forget About Me from The Breakfast Club. The latter has even become the song most associated with John Hughes, and for good reason, as it so brilliantly begins and ends the movie it originated in. My absolute favorite film John Hughes was involved with is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I think this is a wonderfully directed and written film, and one in which he was firing on all cylinders. In the beginning, it seems like the usual teenage romp, with Ferris faking sick so he can take a day off from school. However, as more characters are introduced, storylines are developed, and jokes are delivered, it becomes something truly special. Whether it's Ferris on the parade float or Prince Baruni's interactions with his secretary Grace, there's so many unforgettable moments in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. However, it's not merely a wish fulfillment teenage fantasy or a tribute to the city of Chicago, although it is those things too. It's about how Ferris's actions affect everyone around him, whether it's the fellow students who worship him at school or the sister who's frustrated at the attention he gets. And most importantly, you have his friendship with Cameron. Many people view the film as Ferris just having the time of his life and enjoying day off, but almost everything he does is primarily for Cameron's benefit. Cameron is the one he's trying to show a good time towards and inspire him to get out of his rut. Ferris does not change too much over the course of the film, but Cameron absolutely does. It's the elaborate ways he helps his friend, along with an excellent performance from Matthew Broderick, that makes him a memorable character. Ferris Bueller's Day Off is so endlessly rewatchable, and every writing and directorial decision Hughes made, along with the input from the actors, made it something truly special. Hughes did not have time to direct all of his scripts, so he usually bring in someone else to help bring them to screens, with Howard Deutsch being a frequent choice. One of those was Some Kind of Wonderful, which brought a sensitivity to the characters on screen. This film was actually born out of Deutsch and Hughes' disappointment in having to film a new ending to their earlier collaboration, Pretty in Pink. Some Kind of Wonderful featured Hughes' usual theme of showing how young people don't fit into neat little boxes, and is yet another example of his understanding of how teenagers operate. He made the audience invest in the characters and the dilemmas they faced, which resonated with many who went to see them. At a certain point, Hughes felt he was ready to move on from teenage stories, especially when actors like Ringwald and Anthony Michael Hall chose to grow up themselves. With Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, he directed a hilarious comedy with a man trying to get home for the holidays. Pairing up Steve Martin and John Candy was a stroke of genius, and Hughes wrote some fantastic dialogue exchanges for both them and other characters. Martin displays Neil's frequent frustrations so well, especially the famous scene where he launches into a series of F-bombs when trying to rent a car. 
Meanwhile, Candy made Dell into a sympathetic figure. There's a particularly great moment when Dell gives a speech to Neil after the latter launches into a hurtful tirade. It's a well-written scene beautifully played by Candy. Hughes was often really good at mixing the comedic tones with the serious thoughts his characters often had, and I think it's because of the personal feelings he brought to his writing. The most personal film he ever made was She's Having a Baby. Knowing anything about Hughes' life, it's obvious he was writing about himself with that film. Kevin Bacon plays an aspiring writer, gets a career in advertising, much like Hughes did, and Bacon is even made to look like Hughes, especially when he's wearing glasses. Throughout the film, we see him dealing with the difficulties of marriage and the expectations placed upon him and his wife to start a family. A lot of this is portrayed through fantasy sequences, and these add another element to a film that eventually builds up to the lead character awaiting the birth of his child. Despite being titled, She's Having a Baby, that only becomes pivotal in the third act, but the journey getting there is still compelling. The film was a box office disappointment and did not get good critical reviews, which Hughes was apparently hurt by. He had put so much of himself into that film, and to see her rejected like that had a lasting effect on him. Maybe that's why he went for more of a broad, crowd-pleasing comedy with his next film, Uncle Buck. Hughes again made good use of John Candy as an uncle coming in to take care of his brother's children, and he came up with funny ways to utilize both his character and the children. It was just a simple, funny comedy, although nonetheless made time to properly develop the personalities on screen and hope things turn out well for Buck and them. Where you start to see a shift in John Hughes' career was when he decided to write a Christmas comedy about a young boy who gets left home alone and has to fend off some burglars. Hiring Chris Columbus to direct Home Alone had Hughes' usual penchant for funny dialogue and interesting characters, although some of the more heartwarming moments, like Old Man Marley, came courtesy of Columbus's rewrites. Home Alone was a massive box office success, with the slapstick scenes being what most people remember, although many of those are reserved for the end, when the burglars enter the McAllister house. Following Home Alone, Hughes' output in the 90s primarily consisted of slapstick family comedies. I've often wondered if that was all the studios wanted from him from then on, and those were the only scripts they would greenlight, or if he reached a period where that was what he most wanted to do. After all, it's not like Slapstick was absent from his prior films. Rooney's antics and Ferris Bueller's Day Off are not that far removed from Harry and Marv in Home Alone, and even The Breakfast Club has a bit of that sort of humor. However, there was a formula that developed in his scripts from then on. The last movie he directed was Curly Sue, which featured many of the hallmarks of his 90s era. There was a fair amount of slapstick, along with heavy sentimentality and over-the-top characters and shenanigans. After that, he stuck to writing and producing, although he did attempt to direct a comedy titled The Bee, about a man who keeps being tormented by a bee. The project was set up at Disney, with Hughes being reportedly enthusiastic about it and experimenting with special effects for the titular buzzing insect. Hughes never got to make it, although there was a recent Netflix show starring Rowan Atkinson that had an incredibly similar premise. An event that really hit John Hughes hard was the death of John Candy. Even though they'd apparently had a bit of a falling out at the time, Hughes still thought highly of Candy and was devastated when he heard the news. That was one of a few reasons he decided to move to Chicago and work mostly at home. Even though he was and is still praised for his originality, that seemed to fade away in the 90s. Home Alone 2 was blatantly the first movie again, but with the setting changed to New York City. Baby's Day Out utilized that formula, but this time with a baby being chased by criminals who are hurt in absurd ways. He made a film adaptation of the Dennis the Menace comic strip, which again featured a young boy whose antics harm a dangerous criminal. At one point, he got the rights from Charles Schultz to make a live-action Peanuts movie. Who knows how that would have turned out? He was even one of several filmmakers who met with Audrey Geisel to get her permission to produce a live-action adaptation of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Hughes also got into the remake business, starting with Miracle on 34th Street. He was additionally behind Disney's live-action version of 101 Dalmatians. While it followed the animated film fairly closely, he could not resist turning the bandits Horace and Jasper into clones of Harry and Marv, and had the various animals concoct all kinds of ways for Coella de Vil to get brutalized in the third act. He also wrote and produced Flubber, a remake of The Absent-Minded Professor, along with making yet another Home Alone sequel. It really is remarkable the split in the kinds of films he was making in the 90s versus what he gave audiences in the 80s, but the studio seemed to give him enough freedom to work in peace. What's surprising is there were piles of scripts he wrote that the studios have on file and that nobody has thought to bring out. One that Howard Deutsch was keen to direct was a dialogue-driven road trip movie intended for Matthew Broderick and Molly Ringwald. It never happened, but I don't see why somebody could not eventually pick it up and get it made. The comedy Drill Bit Taylor was based on a story idea John Hughes had, although he otherwise had no creative involvement with the finished film. When he died in August 2009 at the age of 59, it was a shock. He was a filmmaker who spoke to a generation and will continue to speak to those who find his films later on. He led a fascinating career and was someone who was passionate about writing and bringing his ideas out there for people to see, although he was also said to be very self-critical. He was a talented director and writer, and one who carved a filmography with several worthwhile movies. See you next time.